flower in the crannied wall. I pluck you out of the crannies. I hold you here, root and all, in my hand, little flower. But if I could understand what you are, root and all, and all in all, I should know what God and man is. There is a great labyrinth ahead of us, full of nooks and crannies. We are on a quest for hidden keys to gain a better understanding of medieval architecture and why it originated in the Middle Ages. What does a better understanding mean? Well, it all started with two Frenchmen, didn't it? Mr. Falconelli told us that the cathedrals once held a mystery and Mr. Victor Hugo told us that classical architecture, which arose during the renaissance of the 1400s and reigned until the beginning of the 19th century, had a dead set agenda on replacing, and in turn destroying, the medieval architecture of the Middle Ages. Together, these two Frenchmen suggest that medieval architecture had a secret that a force in our world did not want us to know about. So we're going to put them to the test. Is there a lost secret? Could Falconelli be correct? Do the cathedrals really hold a great mystery? Well, I can tell you right now, no, Falconelli is not correct. There is no lost secret and the cathedrals do not hold a mystery. No, they hold many. That's right, the mysteries of the cathedrals, plural. You know medieval architecture, don't you? Of course you do. If we were playing a word association game and pick the word medieval, you'd shout, knights on horseback, dragons, castles, moats, kings. And if I said the word gothic, I bet you shout the following, dark, ghosts, cemeteries, monsters, bad makeup. And if I pick cathedral, maybe you'd shout, Gargoyles, spires, god, bells, prayer, choir, holy. You see, the third one, cathedral, yields better results. But if you combine the two, gothic cathedral, what are you left with? A dark shadow over a divinely inspired structure. A slightly problematic and confusing stereotype that has a long and, I'd argue, deliberate historical formulation. You know medieval and gothic architecture. I know you do. Those imposing wonders of stone geometry entered our collective imagination a long time ago. They haunt the misty moors of Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre. They birthed monsters such as Frankenstein and Dracula. They summon the spirits in the Lady in Black and the turn of the screw. Their chambers contain devilish portraits such as Dorian Greys. They populate fantastical realms where dragons, men, elves, orcs and sorcerers battle over magic rings. They are formed of the same stonework that clasps Arthur's sword. The medieval architectural style ignites the imagination like no other. And the cathedrals, minsters, abbeys and churches. If you live in Europe, then you don't have to venture far until you can spot one. This is especially true if you live in a country like England. I don't think you can travel 10 miles in a country like this before you see one on your horizon. Spires and towers pierce the twilight, bruised skies above, like the upturned rusted swords of fallen Mercian kings. In towns like Lincoln, Lichfield, York, Wells, Gloucester, Peterborough, the cathedrals tempt and beckon a person's imagination. Come with me, they say, back through the foggy, lamp-lit lanes of lost time to an era in which England may not have been part of a broken kingdom, but something else entirely. But did you know that despite their stereotypical reputation as settings for the macabre and the eerie, many used to be painted inside. I'm not lying. Some 19th century Gothic revival pieces pay homage to the style's painted past. Many interiors of these divine structures were a kaleidoscope of brilliant color. And if you have a keen eye for it, you can still today see remnants of the paint in so many of these structures. Sometimes it's more obvious.
Sometimes it's subtle. And sometimes it's almost unnoticeable, almost faded beyond recognition. Greens, blues, yellows, reds. They don't emphasize the colorful paint in the ghost stories, do they? And what's even more staggering is this. If you start visiting many medieval structures, you'll notice something. The stone outside, especially on the north and west facing exteriors, is very aged. As expected, right? If a minster is over 700 years old, then you'd expect time has left its mark, especially the places that don't get much sun. But if you venture inside, you'll see that the interiors, the piers and columns etc have not aged so dramatically. And why? Because they were not exposed to the elements, the weather outside. So why did most of the paint disappear? It wasn't time, no. It was scrubbed away by man. And why? Could the painting have told a certain story? A different story, perhaps? And painted by whom? Well, that's an obvious one, isn't it? Craftsmen. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. The tanner, the painter, the shoemaker. The apocryphy, the carpenter, the cloth maker. The mason. These are the guilds of the medieval period. The medieval stonemason was not just anyone with a mallet and chisel. They were highly skilled craftsmen. At once an architect, engineer, builder, an artist and visionary with a boldness and courage like no other. The medieval stonemason system was a hierarchy of three classes, apprentice, journeyman, and master mason. The master mason oversaw a legion of different craftsmen, all working in unison to complete different aspects of these magnificent structures. And in the hunt for faded patches of paint, you may stumble across something else no less extraordinary. The mason's signature on the stone. They are usually in the form of little geometric shapes. Each shape is an individual mason's specific mark. It means a particular mason carved that particular block. I enjoy nothing more than hunting these out. Sometimes sites document all the mason signatures and can point them out to you, but most of the time you have to seek them out. It's all about slowing down and starting to look closer. Sometimes from afar, an arch is just an arch, but if you really look, you may see traces of the work process. Individual stones numbered, indicating their intended placement in the arch. The nooks and crannies of real masonry. Southwell Minster is one of my favourite medieval structures of all time, and it holds one of the most stunning treasures in the world, its octagonal chapter house. If you can, then don't wait. Go and see for yourself the leaves of Southwell, the finest stonework in all of England. This is not just naturalistic carving, it's a bower full of secrets within a larger forest of stone. The leaves, fruit, flowers are accompanied by animals, hounds catching hares, birds perching, and not just leaves, but buttercups. Maple, wormwood, vine, oak, hawthorn, ivy, a rose, flower in the crannied wall. Look at the sublime arches and capitals. Each piece of stone is one block, and the masons have carved the leaves out of the same block, somehow hollowing the space behind them. Look at the star-ribbed ceiling and its centerpiece. And every time you visit, you discover something new. It's full of surprises, hidden away. For instance, this capital holds a secret. And you have to sit down and look up to spot it. What's above and behind the leaves here on the capital? Two little stone pigs tucked away and grazing. 
And it's not just Southwell. The attention to naturalistic detail is found all across medieval and gothic stonework. We even see it honoured in the revival pieces. Look, butterflies resting on leaves, bees humming, and parrots nestling in the foliage. There's always a surprise waiting to be found. You see this little nugget of stone right here? That's a little mouse. And what does this reverence of the natural world tell us? Does it confirm Francis and Joseph Giles' assertion that although St. Augustine believed that man could best perceive God directly through faith, most medieval thinkers were followers of an alternative tradition, that of Boethius, who believed that knowledge of God could be attained through examination of the beauty and order of the universe. As Boethius wrote, Men of reason sought the causes of things, why the Siam winds vex the sea waters, what spirit turns the stable world, and why the sun rises out of the east to fall beneath the western ocean, what tempers the gentle hours of spring, what causes fertile autumn to flow with bursting grapes in a good year. It was all about nature's secret causes. Could this be true? Did the medieval Europeans really believe that the best way to perceive God is through contemplation of the natural world? Where the wind shakes the leaves, there's God. The sound the brook makes as it navigates through stony outcrops, there's God. Nature's secret causes. And then there's the mystery of the green man. A figure of an anonymous man with a face made of or inextricably bound with the leaves. He's found everywhere throughout medieval architecture, usually hidden away somewhere out of obvious sight. He's the Where's Wally of medieval architecture, and you can have some fun travelling around from site to site trying to locate him. But what does he represent? A pagan god? A woodland spirit? A demon? Here he is at Southwell, with leaves ushering from his mouth. There are many green men to be found within this chapter house. Is he a pagan demon? Or perhaps he is a reminder, as Nigel Coates puts it, of the elemental link between man and nature. We come from the earth, and we go back to it. Or as Tennyson said about his little flower, if I could understand what you are, root and all, and all in all, I should know what God and man is. Nature's secret causes. They don't show you the naturalistic carvings in the horror movies, do they? And did you know that many, not all of them, but many cathedrals, minsters, abbeys and churches are cardinally aligned, especially in England? The choir is usually a line pointing toward the east, and the nave the west. Why would that be? Perhaps the skeptics would say, because Christianity is secret sun worship. But could there be another reason why a large majority of these structures, but not all, are aligned like this? If you're ever lost when out hiking around the European countryside, and you've forgotten your compass, but stumble across an ancient church, you may just be in luck. The nooks and crannies, the secrets and mysteries, we're after them. There is a great labyrinth ahead of us, so what's it all about? I am going to try and tell a story of the Gothic with a particular focus on the United Kingdom and Europe by extension. But no, that doesn't really cut it. Gothic is not the right word. Gothic architecture was born in the 12th century and ended in the 16th century. Our inquiry transcends this period. I will also be exploring what came before. Okay, how's this? I am going to try and tell a story of medieval architecture and the Middle Ages with a focus on Europe. That's better, but not spot on. As you will see, medieval architecture transcends the Middle Ages. We will also be looking at both antiquity, the time period before the Middle Ages began, and modernity, the time period that followed. And although I will be focusing on Europe, this does not mean that geographic spaces and nations outside of its boundaries are not important. 
nor does it mean that I will not be exploring and drawing on them to inform my arguments. What it means is I do not have the experience or jurisdiction to make a real argument for the architecture outside of Europe. Why? Because I cannot go and explore it firsthand. When I do discuss spaces outside of Europe, I will be engaging with them in an academic sense, i.e. with the historical literature, the arts, photographs and so on. Ah, the complexity. It's terribly hard to summarise. I think I put it better earlier. Our two Frenchmen suggest that medieval architecture had a secret that a force in our world did not want us to know about. So we're going to put them to the test. Much better. I am hoping what we discover will help shed some light on other matters. Two of which I will outline now. The first is a certain theory that's been floating around for some time now. Have you heard of it? That there was a mud flood or cataclysm that took place at some point between the 17th and 19th centuries and as a result wiped out a previous civilization that built all the amazing structures of the past. And not only that, but many of these structures were originally constructed as technology to generate energy. The second is the work of Anatoly Fomenko. Many do not realise that Fomenko's work was actually the central driving influence in the conception of the mud flood reset theory. While we will explore Fomenko in detail much later, a very basic summary of his work is that roughly a thousand years of our chronology are fabricated through means of phantom copies or duplication of other historical events. And that antiquity, as we know it, the Romans, the Greeks and Egyptians actually occurred during the Middle Ages. Fomenko's work is fascinating and worth reading, even if you do not agree. And as you will see, I both disagree and agree with Fomenko on a lot of points. Through all of this, I will be making a handful of arguments of my own in relation to the Middle Ages and medieval architecture, spanning topics such as technology, historical fabrication, theology and spirituality, social and economic politics. And it's worth outlining now some central, overarching questions that I intend to ask and investigate. Does the birth of Gothic architecture in the 12th century demonstrate that the real industrial revolution of Europe actually occurred during the Middle Ages? Was the industrial revolution that took place in Great Britain between 1760 to 1820 not really a technological revolution at all, but an applied expansion of pre-existing technology and formulated with the aim of destabilizing Europe and establishing globalization and by extension globalism? Was there an attempt to implement globalization during the 14th century that failed and resulted in a catastrophic end to the Middle Ages? If so, why did it fail? Well, that sounds a little serious and boring, right? But really, in essence, it's like I said before, we are on the quest for keys to put our two Frenchmen to the test. And what is a key? Well, just about anything really. A key could be a piece of architecture, it could be a book, a painting, a poem, a map, a geographical location, a word, a name, a sentence, a symbol, it could be from antiquity, the middle ages, the 19th century or even our current era. Absolutely anything. If it opens a door, it's a key. But this doesn't mean all keys are useful either. Some open doors only for you to reach a dead end later down the line. And no doubt this will happen to us, but the keys are the goal. And I'd like to share with you now one of the keys that we're exploring much detail later. Finding keys is like falling in love or falling asleep. You cannot orchestrate falling in love. You can't force this one and you cannot force sleep. You cannot will yourself to sleep with your mind. If you do this, you'll be up all night tossing and turning. But if you let go, it tends to happen naturally. You fall. It happens unexpectedly. Keys are the same. You can't find a key if you're looking too hard. If you're going here and there with a theory or preconception in mind, the keys find you. 
but you have to be open enough to even realize what they are. It was my lady's birthday and I took her to Wales. Lucky girl, right? Very lucky indeed, for I had no idea, but a very special key was waiting. This key is a certain type of key, a cross key. Wait, instead of me explaining it to you, just follow me. Long float on shipless oceans I did all my best to smile Till your singing eyes and fingers Drew me love This is, this is the living waters. St Winifred's Well in Holywell, Wales. It is a spring that comes from deep within the earth. And look, it bubbles delicately into this magnificent gothic structure and sparkles in this star before travelling into this pool. The living waters. In 1189, Richard I is said to have visited the site to pray for the success of his crusade. It has been a site of pilgrimage for almost a thousand years of recorded history. Holywell is the Lourdes of Wales. The spring produces miraculous healing waters, of which reports, according to Paul Burns, go back to the early medieval period. The living waters from deep within the earth. and look above the spring. Look at this structure. These special springs are everywhere across the United Kingdom, most now forgotten and out of sight. But not all. In a region named Derbyshire, they still practice the ritual of Christian well-dressing that stems from the Middle Ages. And again, the waters of these springs are also reported to produce miraculous cures. 
the site of Holywell now chlorinates its spring water. What a tremendous shame. A cross key. It opens two doors. What doors? Well, firstly it gives us real evidence of the presence of the living waters within a gothic structure. And what else? The mud. Look a little closer and reset your mind. What happens if I raise the ground here? What are we left with? A grassy path to a church and a little chapel. What's under your feet? The mud flood as an isolated worldwide cataclysm is a very weak theory. And in Stolen History's reality check, Thomas Christian Leibel teases nuance when he asks whether the mud flood could not have been an isolated incident, but something that's occurred multiple times in our history. And what an excellent question. There was no mud flood in the United Kingdom, but something certainly occurred multiple times over the last few hundred years. Look again, raise the ground. Have you ever considered culverting? A culvert is a man-made structure that channels water past an obstacle. In essence, it's a subterranean waterway or a sewer. They come in all sizes. They can be used to redirect water, for sewage, even transport. And it's been going on for centuries. You have to shift a lot of land to build culverts. When they are found beneath roads, they are frequently empty. Who famously built the roads? In the Lost Rivers of London, Nicholas Barton tells us there exists, unknown to most Londoners, a whole system of underground rivers beneath the streets, as intricate and mysterious as those which pour from cave to cave in the heart of the Pyrenees. There was no mud flood in the United Kingdom. No, there was a burial perhaps multiple burials since the Renaissance, beginning with the erasure of the medieval. The ground is always raised around these medieval structures. A mud flood would not be so selective. But sometimes, like with Holywell, the ground isn't raised to bury the entire lower half, and there are clues. See here, what's inside? A crypt, or perhaps something else. Did there exist a lost guild? Who were the Cistercians? Were they really monks? Revo, Tintin, Buildwas, Furnace, Fountains, Cistercian Abbeys. Who dissolved them? Who destroyed and buried them? The Living Waters, Nature's Secret Causes, buried long ago and made secret. Even in a place like London, UA Thamfor puts it beautifully. At our feet they lie low, the little firm and underground rivers of London. Ephra, Graveney, Falcon, Quaggy, Wandle, Walbrook, Tyburn, Fleet, whose names are disfigured, frayed, effaced. These are the Magogs that chewed the day to the basin that London nestle in. These are the currents that chiseled the city, that washed the clothes and turned the mills, where children drank and salmon swam, and wells were holy. They have gone under, boxed, like the magician's assistant, buried alive in earth, forgotten like the dead. Boxed, forgotten like the dead, buried like the dead. Where do we bury the dead? Tennyson wrote his poem, Flower in the Crannied Wall, at Wagoner's Wells in East Hampshire, England. It's a series of man-made ponds with connecting streams. They created the ponds in the 18th century. There are so many examples such as this all over the country. You see, all those old watercourses and streams from the springs had to go somewhere. You can't just shut them off. They must be redirected, pulled, repurposed as fountains, controlled. The creation of many English stately homes in the 18th century serve as an example of a redirected, repurposed and revised medieval water system. When it comes to the medieval, so much of it traces back to water. Have you ever seen this medieval plan of Canterbury Cathedral? Can you see all the green, yellow and red lines? Do you know what they are? That's a water system, 
fonts, the sceners, it runs throughout the entire structural complex. I have found many keys that testify to, hint at, and underline the communion between medieval architecture and the natural living waters. But only in Europe, and primarily the United Kingdom. Like I said, I don't have the experience to talk about the rest of the world. But what an incredible proposal. Imagine if people from all over the world could go on a treasure hunt in their own particular nation, region or town to investigate the potential presence of ancient watercourses and springs, to examine whether they interacted with their own medieval and architectural history and whether they were boxed like a magician's assistant. The nooks and crannies, the mysteries of the past, the labyrinth for weights. But you're hesitant, aren't you? You know what stepping into a labyrinth like this means. Jorge Louis Borges captured it best in his short story, The Two Kings and the Two Labyrinths, in which the Babylonian king orders his subjects to build him a labyrinth so confusing and so subtle that the most prudent men would not venture to enter it, and those who did would lose their way. Each step we take through this labyrinth is a chapter, an inquiry, a portrait, a puzzle, a paradox, a conundrum that we would try to unravel and examine. But there are no guarantees. We are going to be playing riddles in the dark and I cannot give you assurance that we will solve them. What is the purpose of a labyrinth? To make you lost. And it does make you wonder, doesn't it? Why on earth anyone would enter such a frightening structure? Quite simply, to revel in their own bewilderment. It's time to begin. Oh, and I almost forgot an important question. You don't have a phobia of minotaurs, do you? No? Well, that's good news. Just me then. Okay, enough chit chat. Let's get going. Our first puzzle isn't going to solve itself. 